Det er helt, helt utrolig spennende å få være med på dette forslaget. Hei, hva er det for Vi fulgte hverandre parallelt med et veldig stort avstand. Dette er alltid raskt nedover med de aksje farger av hvit og rød over. Hvor mange er 310 Det er filmer jeg har på tegn! Det er hår jeg har! Og dame! Fy faen, det er bare brennbom! Det lyser med en fantastisk intensitet opp til en megawatt. Har det vært beregnet at dette her lyser ut? Det lyser lenge. Hvor i all verden er ledningen da? Hvor er drivstofftanken som klarer å få dette her til å lyse? Det er like stort som et hus nå da. Hestdalen. This remote mountain valley in Norway, 30 km north of the mining town Røros, has a population of only 120. There was once four times as many people living here, but today many homes are empty. But why is there a blue container placed far up on one of the hillsides, with cameras covering the valley? Is there something going on in Hestalen of an unusual character? The light phenomena here in Hestal in Norway started uh, in late 81, well, uh, with a lot of sightings. At the most it was 20 sightings a week. The local people here started to see the light down in the valley, sometimes close to their houses, and uh, they were wondering what could this be, and there were, some was a little bit afraid too, because no one could give them any answer. What could it be? And this was became known for the public through newspapers, etc. And uh, people started to go up here and see if they could see it for themselves. And many people did. Men då stod vi en 30-40 personer och kikade. Och plötsligt kom då det lyser genom skydäcket och ned längs fjällsidan og stoppa rett foran oss og seg forbi. Og vi fulgte dem med blikket, og nede i dalen lenger frem sto det et lys og ventet på den. Og i det øyeblikk falt jo alle mine teorier om fly, meteoritt, kulelyn. For det første var det jo ikke noe lyd fra dette her. A long oval-shaped light phenomenon appeared to be landing. It came up the valley along the mountainside, stopped and rotated slowly. The race they then say put up, so it stores them in stalks up on the hill. And da var det akkurat som når du ser ind i solen, så ser du en silhuet ind i det det lyse. This picture is taken with 1 60th of a second exposure. The phenomena behaves very different. Some is moving very slowly, 
and some lights can move very fast. The fastest speed we have ever measured was 30,000 kilometers an hour. And uh, we have also recorded the uh, slower speed. We have also recorded uh, on the radar uh, uh, something moving without uh, being seen by a light. So it's, it's in invisible, but it's uh, a strong recording on the radar. So it's actually there, there is something which is moving around. Ja, hestaren som du ser innover her slik, den er cirka en 15 km lang. Den er ikke så, så veldig stor da. Men så har du en fjellside i, på øst og fjellside i vest. Det har jo vært mye i, for, mot disse fjellet som dette har blitt sett veldig mye da. Many strange photos were taken of the phenomenon during the first years. The lights were difficult to capture on film due to long distances and rapid movements in the dark. Even on short exposures down to one hundredth of a second, the lights covered a large area of the film. What kind of lights would behave this way, night after night, in this harsh environment? I 84 Så registrerer vi et eller som står overfor oss. Og det er et lys som vi står og ser på, som står og funker det sånn som det her. Og det er blågrønt, og det står og, ja, en cirka 5-10 sekunder. Det virker som en evighet, og så plutselig så, whoosh, så drar det bortover i vestover. Jeg følte ingen frykt, men tenkte jeg kanskje at det var så heldig at det hadde kommet såpass tett inn på det. For før så hadde vi sett på avstand, kan du si, på mange kilometer. Det kom noen sånne runde kuler som kunne glidende sinne over dagen. Og etter hvert så var det så vanlig at det var ikke hjertet lenger. Men her var mye mer spennende, for det var mye nærmere. There were many efforts to explain these phenomena. Could it be aeroplanes, or the light from a distant railroad reflected in the sky? Or maybe ball lightning? or was it satellites, planets, or meteors? But the speed and the way the light moved, often beneath the treetops, eliminated all such explanations. The phenomenon remained unexplained. Det som er det rare med det lysfenomenet her, er at det har så mange forskjellige typer observasjoner. Det er nesten så vi kan dele inn i kategorier, og en type kategori er hurtige lysglimt, som ofte kan være vanskelig å se på grunn av den korte tiden som de varer. Men de er sterke, så det blir registrert på film og så videre. En annen type kategori er store lysfenomener som på en måte går sakte rundt omkring, som kan vare timesvis. Og en tredje type kategori er vel mer hvor du har flere lyspunkter samlet på en måte, som varierer, slokker, tennes og så videre, sånne ting. Det er jo de hovedkategoriene, kan du si, og så har du andre typer også som det ikke er blitt observert så mange av, da, men som også er, kanskje må tas med inn i bildet. Så utseende oppførselen er ganske forskjellig, vil jeg si mellom de kategoriene, og som gjør det selvfølgelig vanskelig å finne en løsning. Three main categories of light. But the fourth category, what was that? Was there more to this than only lights? After a while, brave locals came forward and told of other observations, including large solid objects. Ja, jeg har sett to forskjellige variasjoner. Ja. Den ene er blank og oppløst. Ja. Og den har en mer som sigarformer, og er opplyst i begge hendene med en svart parti, en mørt parti midt på. Beveger det seg? Ja, i forskjellige hastigheter, og det hender seg også at det stopper opp og står. Ja, på vår hus er det i grenn lenger bort her. En åge skulle vi gå og kjøre tømmerne på elven der en kveld, med snøskuttere. Så jeg skulle vi følge og hjelpe her også, for det var mørt. Så skulle jeg rulle det tømmerstokkene på plass, ja, og det gjorde det. 
Så jeg satte mig opp på tømmerstokken og, og koset meg der til månskjerna med en røk og det, og satt og stira. Og der fikk jeg se det kom i lys ifra sø. Helt stilt, det var ingen lyd eller noe. Og det kom Emilia med og det granen der. Og det gikk noe langt unna der jeg var. Og det var to lys på det der som kom her, jeg så det var en, det var en farekost altså. Det var, ja du kan tenke deg i, i kneipere som er flatt på ned, og så at det kuves opp slik. Så var det ikke lys nemme frampå der, og gikk litt rann oppå. Så det var ikke noe fly det, nei. Men hva det var, det vet ikke vi enda. Vi er bevittnet på at vi har sett det, så har det eh, 68 observasjoner. Og det er nedskrevet, ja. Og når var de siste observasjonene? 11. juni. Det er noe eh, i 2006. Og det var cirka 30 varmegrader i sola den dagen. Og helt klår himmel. Og da så vi eh, som en syvinder over fjellet her. Men så var det rare med det, den observasjonen, det var at sola skjer ikke på på der syllyden på sørsida, der hun skulle ha skjedd, men på nordsida, der det skulle ha vært skygge. Jeg kjørte opp med bussen om morgenen når hun var halv åtte, tenkte jeg oppover her, hestarslia, innover mot hestaren i fråen da, her. Og jeg var alene i bussen, og så når jeg kom nesten opp på toppen, så fikk jeg da se at det kom en en lysende gjenstand, det var jo på våren det her, men det var liksom en liten soloppgang, så at de så det glinsa i metallet på det her fartøyet eller sånt da. Det var som eh, luftskipet Norge, kan en si da, det var en sånn formasjon som det var, vi vet jo aldri hvordan det så ut. Det gikk og forsvant da mot det nord, men det, det gikk inn i atmosfæren liksom på en måte. Så får jeg se et blinkende lys innover hestaren. Stående speider og så på her plutselig så kommer det med et, en gjenstand. Da sto jeg og beskuet ham der på cirka 300 meters avstand. Det var som en spøkelsesfly. Selv metallik hadde et blinkende rødt lys fremme. Og så var det to blanke lys som sto lodret opp på hverandre bak da. Det var formet omtrent som en pistolkule på en, en 9 mm pistol. Jeg kan fortelle dere, men uh, vinterkveld, uh, ja det var i februar eller mars. Og så når jeg kom opp av pastarslia da, så var det noe mørkt. Men når jeg kom mest opp på toppen, opp på kjøren der som vi sier, der ble det opplyst rundt meg. Det ble opplyst den dagen. Så kom det nå og for over bil. Det var som en opplyst herrehatt. Gammeldags slik stor herrehatt med brem på det. Som for over bil og fremover. Jeg så skogen oppe i Rognefjellet og alt. Ja, det var rar, rart, skal jeg si det å se. Så at dere kjørte i mørka og så plutselig ble det opplyst rundt det. These reports had the characteristics of classic UFO observations, leading to massive resistance against the phenomenon in the media. The local people in Hestalen were soon being ridiculed. Vi var fryktelig latterlig gjort. Det var vanskelig å reise i, i uh, hovedbygda i Åla og på handel. Og da, det var bakgrunnen for at vi gjorde de første undersøkelsene allerede i 84 hvor vi da hadde instrumenter her oppe, og fikk gjort målinger når dette fenomenet var her. A small group of enthusiasts from UFO organizations in Norway and Sweden conducted the first investigations, partly supported from a university and with equipment from the military. Electromagnetic measuring equipment, low frequency radio receivers, cameras and radar were mounted on a proper site with a good overview. Would it be possible to capture the phenomenon with this equipment? If so, this would be the evidence many were waiting for. And in the first winter in 1984, 53 observations were made during a month. 
These reports were so astonishing that one of the world's foremost UFO researchers, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, arrived in Hestalen to see for himself. He was the former scientific advisor for UFO studies undertaken by the U.S. Air Force under the name of Project Blue Book. And I'm impressed with Hestalen itself because Hestalen is really a UFO laboratory. It's a place where things are happening and where things can be studied. Well, once we uh, used a laser to point to the phenomena when it showed up and it uh, reacted well, it was a, at that time a flashing uh, light and when we pointed the laser beam to, uh, to, to it, it uh, changed uh, the flashing frequency, it doubled the flashing frequency. And uh, we take it down again and it went back to uh, regular flashing. And we did this uh, test uh, nine times and in eight of those nine times it changed the flashing frequency. Powerful lights with unusual movements, observations of craft-like objects, and responses to laser beams. What kind of phenomenon was this? And still even more peculiar reports were to emerge. In 1984, in a small valley connected to Hestal, three moose hunters are starting their day. What they are about to find can definitely not be explained as seeing things. Laget var på elgjakt og går ut fra hytta inn i ledaren om på morgenen i god tid på førmiddagen. Og når vi har gått i stund så plutselig kjenner jeg at myra begynner å bevege seg under meg. Vi er oppmerksom på at det utskjer i i viss form i tårer der. Jeg begynner å undersøke litt mer om det der og straks ved siden der ser jeg at det ut opptatt i tårer til samme format. Men der sto hølet tomt. Og en fire-fem meter lenger inn på tørrerabben der, det lå torva. Nedsatt. Akkurat slik som hun var opptatt. Ingenting var dødt i tår, noen ting. Skjer i helt rene, rene kanter. Og den der juften har lige, ja, tjukkelser på torven da. Mellom 35 og 40 centi. Og så blev et mur, så det der vil Anna ville være inn. Ja, anslig, de anslår det en halva, halvannet og til to tom. Og gå dit en par timers gange uansett hvem går ifra. Minst. Og ikke, det finnes ikke spor i hele tatt. Så det er ikke med menneskelig makt uten å tønge risker på det og løfte den der og flytte så langt. What has the ability to cut out a piece of soaking wet turf weighing two tons and place it undamaged five meters away? The tree roots in the turf are cut with razor blade precision. Det der bildet nå ble tatt om våren etter vi fant det om høsten. Men det vises nå likevel ganske tydelig. Det finnes redskap og maskiner som gjør det mest utrolig, men akkurat den der arbeidsoperasjonen kan ikke forestille deg med noen verdensning som kunne ha tatt og flyttet. Later it appears that the same things had happened two years earlier further north in Norway, at Andøya, with precisely the same kind of cut and of exactly the same size. Was it the same phenomenon in operation? Was this the result of an unknown type of ball lightning, or was someone from another world gathering test material? In spite of the eyewitness reports of craft-like UFOs and signs of mysterious landings, the researchers decide to concentrate on the light observations. This is a part of the phenomena where they have managed to obtain solid measurements and reliable data. Could it be that the observations of objects are of a totally different kind, requiring a completely different type of approach. Well, according to uh, hadronic mechanics, that's uh, a scientific uh, and far-reaching uh, revolution uh, of the physics uh, of century-old uh, quantum mechanics and uh, relativity theory, and nowadays uh, also of... Uh, 
requiring a completely different type of approach. Well, according to uh, hydraulic mechanics, that's uh, a scientific uh, and far-reaching uh, revolution uh, of the physics uh, of century-old uh, quantum mechanics and uh, relativity th theory, and nowadays uh, also of, uh, uh, being unfolded uh, in hydraulic chemistry and uh, uh, technology, and new, new technologies. According to hydraulic mechanics, uh, there is no problem with uh, space travel and not even with the time travel uh, uh, given uh, certain circumstances and uh, given a certain kind of technology but the physical laws for, for, for traveling through our uh, uh, 3D space uh, with uh, speeds uh, far above uh, the speed of light uh, uh, the equations uh, and the physical models uh, uh, concepts and relations uh, for explaining this uh, um, uh, has been clear for more than uh, 10 years uh, uh, in advanced hydronic mechanics. During the 1990s, the frequency of observations slowly decreased. In the early 80s, 20 observations would be made in a week. 20 to 30 are now made per year. But the group of Norwegian enthusiasts continues their research. In 1994, Erling Strand and his colleagues organized the first international conference on the phenomenon in Hestalen. Leading scientists arrived from eight countries, including the USA, Russia and Japan. The one is that we want to discuss the whole phenomenon, and the other is what we should do with this to find a solution. Dere som er interessert i det uforklarlige, hvordan blir dere mottatt i skal vi kalle det seriøse forskermiljøet i Norge? Vi blir positivt mottatt, og de er veldig interessert i dette her, så lenge det blir gjort på en, en, en riktig måte. Og må du huske på en forsker, det er jo en som skal finne ut noe av det ukjente. The theory is suggesting that the Hestalen phenomena are generated by reflections from car lights, trains, or that they are in some way connected to TV and radio transmitters, are put to rest once and for all. This conference had one important consequence, that the phenomenon is now treated with more respect and for the population in the Hestalen Valley, this is a great relief. I think uh, that uh, this uh, effect is uh, very important in the future, especially in the practice, practice. For example, you can use in this phenomenon like a container of energy, energy, pure energy, not atomic energy, pure energy like hydrodynamic energy and maybe, maybe windly energy, electric energy and In 1998, research in Hestal enters a new phase that was to prove historic. Supported by the Østfold University, the world's first 24-7 observatory for light phenomena is established in Hestalen. With the generous help from one of the local farmers, a large, well-equipped container was placed on one side of the valley. Radar and instruments for measuring electromagnetic noises run continuously, along with video recorders that are activated as soon as unusual aerial movements are detected. Excitement is running high. Will it now be possible to capture the phenomenon on these new instruments? Vi fick upp denna här i då på i august månad i i 98 och då var det ju bara ett kamera här uppe. Eh och allredig efter någon dagar så tog den sitt första fenomen. Each minute the still cameras shoot overviews covering the valley and upload to the internet. Several observations of the phenomenon have been obtained from these cameras all year round. But what about the video cameras? After a year's tense wait, it finally happens. The Hestalm phenomenon is caught on camera. Zooming in and slowing down the film shows something really astonishing. A second light seems to appear from underneath, joining the main light. How could this be interpreted? This footage brings the Hestalen research to a new era. 
Many people in Holtholm municipality have seen the light phenomena in Hestal and the community uh, is ser take it serious and they, we are sure that there, there are something but we don't know and we want the scientists to take uh, to be serious and try to find out what the light phenomena is. We are at the Italian Center for Radio Astronomy in Medicina outside Bologna. The huge antennas are aimed at the stars. The scientists here are scanning the universe for sign of life. Conducted by the SETI program, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, we have recorded a huge amount of data so far, but unfortunately, we could not get any signal yet. Of course, we go on like that. We continue recording signals. We continue analyzing signals, hoping that one day something interesting can come out, of course. After becoming aware of the Hestalm phenomenon, the Italian scientists traveled to Hestalm and had their own experience. From then on, they have supplied the Norwegian research team with valuable support. In Hestalm, the Italians have recently installed their own scientific instruments, including radar and electromagnetic measuring equipment. Uh, now we have installed here a VLF receiver. VLF stands for Very Low Frequency Receiver. In order to uh, investigate on the uh, phenomena that are uh, happening in this valley. The signals are received and analyzed at the Bologna Radio Astronomy Center. So the data collected inside the blue box in Sdal and, uh, and also inside the pedophile is uh, sent every day automatically inside our server. After that uh, we start uh, the processing of that so far, many interesting radar readings have been received from the lights, while photos have been taken simultaneously from the Norwegian Observatory. In this way, data have been confirmed. I would like to remember that uh, this phenomena uh, appear um, in uh, several parts uh, around the world, and uh, of course, uh, as done, very interesting because from the statistical point of view, uh, appear several times. By, uh, by the way, also in Italy, in Australia, USA, uh, Thailand and so on, so many parts of the world uh, is uh, interested in the, this kind of phenomena. This phenomena could, uh, could um, uh, give us information about some kind of unknown, uh, unknown form of energy. In my opinion, any kind of phenomena need to be unknown phenomena need to be investigated. The, uh, this is the, the, the curiosity of the, of the humankind. A new container with more advanced instrumentation is being assembled in Italy and will soon be placed near the top of the Rongne mountain in Hestalen. This cooperative Hestalen Research Association HERA is also planning to establish a larger permanent observatory in the valley. This cooperation between the Östfold University and the Italians is an important incentive to research, now producing new amazing results. In 2004 we here in Hestalen with students and forskare from Italy. We had a number of forskning bases here, for example, the only forskning base on top of the Rognene. We saw the south of the Dalen here. Og midt på natta, sånn ved to-tre tider, så begynte det å skje ting. Eh, det som hendte da var det at det så ut som det var et eh, slags tett eh, objekt. Det kunne se ut som en, kall det metallisk sky. 
som plötsligt uppstod på ett ställe. Och så flyttade det sig och fem gånger så klarte vi att ta bilder av akkurat detta skedde. Och det sista som skedde med den metalliska skinn det var på störelsen av en låve. så försvant den. Och så dyker han då upp som en sån illmörje. Rätt efter det så stoppade den illmörja lyse och så dyker det upp två lys. Det ena är lite större än det andra vid sidan av varandra som kraschar rätt i backen där borta. I det det här skedde att den traff trätoppen där borta så kom det ut en blå spiralerande lysstreck som föll bort över sån den här blå lysstrålen den träffar då toppen på ett trä där borta och med en gång den träffar det rätt efter på det så förändrar den vågelängden i hur den spiralerar bortover. Och då blir det mycket längre mellan var topp och spiral. The results of the first four years of studies in cooperation with the Italians conclude that the phenomenon exists and is periodically active in Hestalen. The phenomenon is identified as a bright flying object with special characteristics making it unique to science. The phenomenon is more complex and diverse than expected, indicating more than one single kind of phenomenon. The phenomenon is sometimes made up of separate units that may depart and fly away. The speed varies from still to 8 kilometers per second. The phenomenon changes course in speeds indicating no mass by physical means. The phenomenon seems to be able to take on pieces of plasma or energy from the ground while passing by. The phenomenon seems to radiate energy due to the light and frequent change of color. Many interesting spectra in the optical and radio frequency range have been detected, but more data is needed to draw proper conclusions. These scientific data are quite sensational. We are dealing with a real existing phenomenon that can be observed and studied even though this is difficult. But why Hestalen? What makes this remote valley different from other locations? Does it have anything to do with the existence of the massive mineral resources located in this area? Kanskje Norges, et av Norges største malmfelt, malmressurser, ligger urørt der, herrsefeltet. Jeg antyder av bergmesteren til å inneholde ca. 16 millioner ton råmalm. Og det er vel kanskje tre ganger så mye malm som det Rørosfeltet og Kyllingdal drev på i 300 år. Da snakker vi om kopper og sink. The 300-year-old copper mines in Rørås, not far away, have connections to the Hestalen geological structures. In Hestalen we also find remains of iron mining, which dates as far back as to the Viking Age, 1,000 years ago. Could this massive concentration of minerals be linked to the phenomenon? But another mineral is also present here. Several old sulfur mines are located along the riverside, and some reports have been connected to this particular mineral. Come over Hestalskjøren, så fikk vi se i lys på den andre siden til dalen, og vi så hele lia, hele Hestalen i over. Og da var det sen nede, så vi kunne telle bjørkene på hele lia på Hestalen. Og så plutselig med at kom det så far lukt, det var rett svovel. Da var det opplyst i flere farver, på begge siden av veien. All snøen var opplyst. I 2004 så tok vi flere bilder etter hverandre på natta, hvor da høstdagsfenomenet dukket opp over den posisjonen her hvor svovelgruva er lokalisert. Det var flere av disse som da var akkurat på samme sted, men startet da flere, flere minutter etter hverandre. Så den gruva her, den er, den er, den er spesiell for hestdagen. But connecting the minerals in Hestalen to the phenomenon is just another theory. 
the appearance of the phenomenon does not seem to follow any fixed patterns. In 2007, a large group of international scientists visit Hestalm as a part of a conference organized by the US-based Society for Scientific Exploration. Many of these experts and scientists study similar phenomena at other places the in the world. The lights of Hestalm are a, a fascinating phenomenon uh, because they just arise over the ground. They're unpredictable whenever they arise. They, they're different shapes, different sizes, different intensities, and different durations. and uh, uh, so it's quite a curious uh, phenomenon. We have no explanation as to the cause at this time. It could be related to uh, natural geophysical phenomena, earthquake uh, precursors, earth lights. These are atmospheric uh, disturbances. Uh, at this point, uh, the, the, the jury is still out. We don't know. But that's part of it, the mystery and that's why it's a good scientific subject. Whether it is, as some people think, Earth light uh, of geological origin, but I don't believe so from what I see as observations. I think it's much more complex. Uh, is there a relation with UFOs? I do not know, but that's a question we have to solve. We do not have to believe this or that. We have to study it and to try to understand it. This is a car driving. The camera shutter has been open for 30 seconds. So we have the spectrum from the car, but here we have the Hestalm phenomena. Here. At the conference, and for the first time ever, results of spectrum analysis of the phenomena are presented. They indicate that the lights contain elements of oxygen, nitrogen and silica, which in reality means air and dust. But there are also traces of the rare element scandium, found existent only in Scandinavia. It's air and dust from Hestal that burns here. But it is some other kind of chemical elements inside it, this scandium. Scandium is an extremely hard material and was used in the production of Soviet fighter planes. It was very, very surprising to find scandium in it. For to be able to take forskning data, we are dependent on many people. We have many forskning stations in the field, so we have established a program called Science Camp, where we involve students and grundschool elevers in up to 14 days, where we have many forskning stations in the field. And in September, we had a little over 100 delegates on a Science Camp that went for a whole week. There are actually two installations. There is the one up here, the one that is the light shining. Den forsterker egentlig lyset. Og dette går jo veldig mye da på å få ungdommer interessert i naturen og i realfag. For å studere realfag ved sen eh, senere. Så det er jo rett og slett en eh, skal jeg si, motivasjonsfaktor vi er ute og jobber med. Altså. Eh, vi skal ta oss og måle sånn radioaktiv stråling i lufta. Og så... Vi skal ta bilder ut over dalen og se om vi får, får noen bilder av dette hestdagsfenomenet. Hovedpoenget med utstyret her er jo å detektere noe som er spesielt ved hestdagsfenomenet. Vi leter jo etter noe som skiller dette lyset fra alt mulig annet. Så den første her, det kamerasystemet her, det tar bilder med veldig lang åpningstid, pluss at det har et spektralgitter foran, så vi kan få se et optisk spekter og få fingeravtrykket til fenomenet. Så du det? Ja, se, der er det. Der er det. Der er det. Synes du ute? Der da. Nei, det beveger seg. Nei. Oi. Sjekk. 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 Vi har hatt et lysfenomen i peiling 312 grader, og det lyste i fjellsida i den retningen der innenfor et minutt. Yes, this uh, spectacular picture was uh, shot from uh, Rogne Mountain, uh, approximately in 1000 meters uh, altitude towards west, and it started to happen things at 
approximately 9.30 in the evening when the Aurora Borealis uh, first show. <laughs> And uh, then we suddenly had a lot of flashes in the valley and then some huge lights that suddenly turned out and moved with a very high speed north-south in the valley. And uh, one spectacular uh, happening was uh, one minute before 10 in the evening. And it, we had a big light that started out and moved very quickly north and south and gave us this very, very impressive uh, picture, which possibly is the best picture ever taken of the hairstyle phenomena. The exposure time uh, was 30 seconds. So we see that the hairstyle phenomena moves from uh, start up here and uh, moves down and then goes up again here. Uh, the distance here it's approximately maybe from 10 to 15 kilometers the distance it has covered and uh, uh, the camera has an optical grating in front of the lens and uh, this grating make this optical spectrum here the one thing that is uh, that surprises us with this spectrum is that it's uh, continuous the colors goes directly over in over in the other color here, and we see no the, no lines or dots here, which will give us a signal of that we have a gas that is burning. This looks like uh, optical spectrum from a solid object, or from uh, plasma with high uh, density, or it could be molecular. Uh, chemical compositions because molecular optical bands have very very narrow lines and I think that the, our equipment has not the resolution to can, could differ the different lines here so a molecular band could give us something that looks like a, a continuous specter. At the same time this observation is registered on radar while the lights were seen only for a few minutes, the radar readings show the phenomenon apparent for a total of four hours. And uh, we are also very curious about the Hestalm phenomena, which looks like a burning ball of fire, that it doesn't expand. In a combust the combustion process, things should expand, like in a motor in a car, but the um, phenomena keeps it in the same volume. It doesn't expand at all, so something must uh, uh, be able to hold this phenomena together, like a big magnetical uh, field, uh, like a plasmoid, an elect uh, magnetic field which uh, entraps plasma and keeps it inside itself. So uh, we are looking for the mechanism that stores the energy and why this energy uh, source uh, uh, is so extremely powerful in, an, in the intensity. If this is a kind of a plasmoid, then we have a localized magnetical field that is able to encompress and uh, keep a huge amount of energy, a plasma, inside a small ball for a long, long time. And this storing mechanism is one of the most interesting uh, things to find out of. And this uh, storing mechanism could also be uh, possibly a new way of storing energy instead of batteries, instead of petrol, instead of uh, nuclear power. Maybe we in the atmosphere have a natural storing mechanism for energy which we never have been able to detect before. The Hestalm phenomenon is alive. The scientists claim to be on the verge of a revolution within physics. Can it be the energy source of the future we are looking at? The idea of extracting energy from thin air or vacuum is not new. 
As early as the 1920s, Nikola Tesla claimed to have discovered enormous energy potential in what he called the flux field or the vacuum field. Today, science has named it zero-point energy. Until now, there is no known method of extracting this energy. Can this be what we see glimpses of in Hestalen? Or is the phenomenon of a character challenging us to expand our conceptions of reality even further? Do the reports from locals in Hestalen indicate that there is more to this than mystical energy alone? Many forefront physicists claim that we should reach for a totally new view on reality. If so, could Hestalen be a portal to a different world? We know there is a lot of energy in it. Uh, we have a lot of data, uh, or some indication on, on the power. And uh, if we find out what this, is, what this power is coming from, maybe we can use that power for the mankind. It can be, for instance, a clean power source. Who knows? We don't know yet. But if we do necessary research, we maybe can find an answer to that question. Can this be a new power? Uh, which the mankind can be using.